Okay. So uh, just a couple of bits of business before we get started. So this is really the last material, new material I'm going to introduce. Um, I have put up a warm up for Friday. It's optional. Um, but if you have anything in the whole course that you'd like to discuss, a problem, a homework question that you could never, be, you were never able to get, or a concept that you were really having struggle with, or one of the concept tests, all of which are posted online, uh, the concept tests are the A, B, C, D questions. Um, then uh, put them in the warm up. You can put it in there if you don't want to. If you don't want to talk in. Um, in the room. If nobody wants to review anything, there is another topic I'd like to talk about, which is basically the introduction to quantum mechanics and sort of uh, to sort of give you the intro to the next course that you would take in physics if you were to go on. But that's less important intro. than making sure everybody um, is comfortable with the material so far. So, so right, so uh, if you have time, <coughs> open the warm up before Friday and write in some comments about either things you'd like to talk about or you know, whether you're uh, interested in something else. But I'm, I'm not going to introduce new material on Friday. It's just getting too late in the semester to do, uh, to, to tackle the next topic, which would really be lenses properly. Would require <coughs> so there's no point in doing that. Um, but we can do a lot of interesting stuff today. There's a lot of stuff about light that we can talk about that we haven't talked about yet. And, and to pick up from last time, right, we discussed two, uh, two different, oops, I want to share. No, not that like that. I want to share content from the camera. So we discussed two uh, two concepts um, last time. We discussed reflection, right? Which is which is quite easy. That if I have a flat surface, a shiny flat surface, and a light ray hits it, the light ray bounces off, and the angle of incidence will equal <laughs> the reflection. That's that's pretty straightforward. Uh, and uh, this is the basic mechanism by which light bounces off of things. But of course, if I have a bumpy circuit surface, then the light <laughs> in the same direction will bounce off in all different directions. Jacob, maybe you could uh, mute your mic. We can hear your coughing. Oh, um, sorry. That's okay. Um, so, uh, and so this is how light bounces off objects and hits our eyes. And then the other thing we're talking about is refraction, where if I have light that goes into a different medium, so for instance, if this is glass and this is air, that what will happen is the light will bend and it will bend towards the normal in the slower medium. So this is the fast medium and this is the slow medium because as the waves move along, they can't move at the same speed. Now that never goes to 90 degrees, and it also follows the pattern that if I reverse the light beam, if it's coming out of the slow medium into the fast medium, I get the same effect. And so this is refraction. And so uh, uh, what we're going to do first today is go through the mathematics of refraction, which you guys have probably already done if you've done the lab. So if you've looked at the lab already, you, you've already gone through the math of this, which is not complicated. Snell's law is not difficult, but it's worth taking a moment to see where it comes from and seeing how we can very easily get to the logic of Snell's law. So the first thing we remember is that the speed of light uh, is equal to 1 over the square root of epsilon naught mu naught, and that is equal to 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second to a very good approximation. It's 2.998 something, right? It's, it's, it's better than 1%. It's, uh, it's 3. Um, but in other media, it's going to go slower. And so we'll define... If I have a slower medium, what I'll define is the ratio of C over V, which is N, which is the refractive index. So this is a different N from all the other Ns we've been using, right? This is this N for in index, I guess. Um, and this, this tells you how slow the medium is. A big number means a very slow medium. Uh, a number of one means a medium that's the same as air or as uh, vacuum. So, um, so now we remember how this works is that when I have a surface, I've got rays of light uh, hitting it, or waves of light hitting it. So this, is, so this is a beam of light that's headed this way. It hits the surface. And then what happens is that when it goes into the surface, the frequency is the same on both sides of the medium. But it starts, but it slows down. And so when it slows down, these rays have to become closer together so that we have, we have um, 
velocity is equal to lambda f, the frequency stays the same on both sides. So if the velocity gets, uh, gets uh, smaller, the wavelength has to get smaller. So the wavelength down here is different from the wavelength up there. Now, I'm gonna, draw, I'm gonna show you a better picture of this just so I don't have to draw this too carefully, taken out of one of the textbooks. And what you can see here is you can see, um, uh, and, and so here what we've done is we've specifically drawn it in such a way so that I've got these points here, A, B, and C, and D. So if I look at this region here, I'm gonna take a bit of wave front here on the top part where at point A in the left-hand side, it's just barely touching the, the interface. Um, which is the name between two media is an interface. And of course, we've all talked, we've, everyone's talked about, uh, heard people talk about computer interfaces, right? The interface in your phone. Interface is, the, is where two things join. It's also the place where you have two piece, different pieces of rock in geology is called an interface. It's wherever you have two different things joining up, a person and a machine, air and glass, whatever, that's called an interface. So we'll have the, we'll have the left side of the ray hitting the interface right here at point A, and then we'll have, take another point D here where the right-hand side of the beam is uh, just entering the interface. So this end of the wave front is entering. So these are wave crests, are the blue, are the, are the horizontal lines. And this is the ray, which is perpendicular to the things. Now we have two angles here we're gonna talk about. We'll talk about, the, we'll talk about the angle of incidence, which we'll talk about exactly the same way that we talked about in reflection, which is the angle between the normal to the interface and the ray. So we're gonna use that inner angle, we're gonna call that the uh, angle of incidence. And then over here, we're gonna have the second angle, which is the angle of refraction, which we'll call theta two, and that's the angle between the ray that leaves and the normal on the other side. And what we know is, is that this angle will be smaller than this angle if this medium is slower than that medium. Okay, so now we can work out the equation just by looking at this diagram really carefully. So the first thing we can notice is, is that this angle here is the same as this angle here. And, we could, and you could just sort of mentally think about this. Is these two are things are at right angles. And so this line and this line at right angles and this line and this line at right angles. So if I move this thing left and right, I'm moving this line left and right. So if I put those two, if I put these two guys together, this angle has to be the same. So this, ang this inner angle here and this inner angle here have to be the same. And similarly, this angle here and this angle here have to be the same. The other thing we say is we see that the distance between each wavefront here is gonna be lambda one, and the difference between each wavefront here is gonna be lambda two. That's gonna be the wavelengths. So what I can do um, to do this is what I can do is I can look at this line right here. And let's say that thing's got length L. So then I can look at the triangle ABD and I can see that I've got an angle here and I can look at the signs of that angle. So let's look at sine theta one. Well, this is theta one here. This is the right angle here. This is the hypotenuse and this is the opposite. So this is equal to lambda one over L. And that's just looking at this triangle there. Now we can do the same thing here and look at this triangle, the bottom triangle. If we look at that one, we have an angle here. And so I can say sine theta two is equal to lambda two over that same distance L. Well, if I put those together and eliminate L, then what I have is I have uh, lambda one over sine theta one equals L equals lambda two over sine theta two. But then the other thing I can notice is that up here on the top half, I can I say something about this lambda. Well, lambda one times the frequency is equal to the velocity up there. And the velocity up there, we remember that, um, so let's say lambda, so lambda one equals V one over F. But we also want to write this in terms of the refractive index. So um, we remember that N, equals C over V. So if I want to know V, V1 equals C over N1. So if I put that in, lambda one is equal to C over N1 
times the frequency. So let's put this, so let's put those things in over here. So I've got, so putting that in for lambda one, I have C over N one times F times sine theta one equals C over N two times F times sine theta two. Well, the C's and the F's will cancel then, and I have one over N one sine theta one equals one over N two sine theta two. So if I just take the reciprocal of that, N one sine theta one equals N two sine theta two. And there we have Snell's law, which tells us how much I get refraction at the two interfaces. It's a, it's a nice little formula, the way it's, the way it's written out. I have on the, on the left hand side, I have things only to do with the top half. And the right-hand side, I have things only to do with the bottom part. And what this tells me is that if I, if I have, if N2 is big, then theta2 has to be small, right? So if, compared to these guys, if N2 is bigger than N1, then theta2 has to be less than theta1, which is to say that if it goes into a slow medium, it bends towards the normal. So this is a nice little geometric argument. And the only thing which we really made use of is that the rays travel perpendicular to the to the wave fronts. That the wave fronts have got wave length, have got wavelengths, and that the frequency of the light is the same on both sides of the interface, which it has to be because at the interface it has to be bobbing up and down with the same frequency as here, and bobbing up and down with the same frequency as here. You can't have if it was bobbing at two different frequencies, then at that interface the waves would be in different places at different times. They they sometimes they'd be together and sometimes they'd be apart, and that doesn't make any sense that you'd have the wave just cut in the middle. So there has to be the same frequency on top and bottom, and that's all you need in order to prove this, which I think is kind of you know worth the time to walk through. Um, and I can also prove in other ways that I'm uh, going to talk about briefly later. So let's uh, let's do a few things with refraction. Let's start with something easy. Okay, so let's walk through the logic with uh, Snell's law. Aaron, how about you get walk us through it very briefly? Sorry, you're you're still muted. Sorry. Yes. So comparing the angles in one and two, mm -hmm. if so, um. Comparing them to the normal, which isn't actually there, but you can perceive it. Yeah. Yeah, it'd be there. So the one that is closer to the normal, if it's bending towards it more, that would be the one that is moving slower. I might have done it backwards. I don't know. I'm not sure if I thought this through. Somebody else. We just said a moment ago that the angle um, I forget what we called the angle, the secondary angle. The, the refraction, uh, the, well, the theta two, or the angle of refraction. Yeah, the angle of refraction was, gonna, in order for it to be, if it was traveling slower, then it was going to be a, a smaller angle than the otherwise, otherwise. So since the angle on the second diagram is bigger, that means it's traveling faster than the first diagram. So, so this is the first question. Which of these has got a bigger angle of refraction, one or two? Two. So remember how we're defining this. 
here's our surface, here's our normal, this is the angle we're looking at. So which one's got a bigger difference from the normal? This well, in that case, it'd be one. Yeah. So this is a big angle, and this is a small angle, right? So I want, so if I have a, a fast medium, a fast medium means a small n. So a fast medium will have a small n and therefore a big angle. So what that tells me is the bigger angle here is one, so this one has to be the faster one, right? So remember, this is air. Air is as fast as you can get. If I had air on the top and the bottom, then the line would continue following the dotted line, right? It wouldn't get bent at all. So the question is, which one's getting bent more? So this one is getting bent more, so this has got to be the one with the medium that's most different. So this is the one where the light has been slowed down a lot. So this is the fast one in comparison between these two. So anybody want me to go through that again? Because a lot of people snapped the wrong answer there and I want to make certain we can get this right. You just repeat the phrase, you said like a fast medium has a small n and then a larger theta too, is that what you right. said? Because n is equal to v over c. If n is big, then that means slow. If n is small, like one, then that means it's fast. Fast, right? So small, so big n means a slow medium. It means, so remember how it works is that uh, air is one, water is 1.3, glass is 1.5, diamond is like 2.4, right? So slow media have big refractive indices. That is to say they really strongly affect the motion of the light. And so if you're strongly affecting the motion of the light, that's where you get the biggest kinks in the, the change in where, from where it was going to how it's going now. So this is a big kink, which means a small theta two. So, so this was the original path. So theta two is small compared to theta one because it's a big N. All right, so you have to get this the right, the right way around. Um, okay. Now let's think about what would happen if we look at something through a medium, right? So normally if I look at a pencil, right, remember how this works. If I have a pencil and if I'm looking at it with my two eyeballs, let's see, let's put two eyeballs up here. And if I'm looking at it with my two eyeballs, what I see is I can look and see the light that's coming from this tip of the pen. And if the angle, if, if I have to look cross-eyed at it to see it, that is the light is coming from narrowly, I know that it's up close. And if it's far away, I know that those two rays will be almost parallel. So, uh, so if I have a, a, a pencil that's out here and I'm looking at the tip of this pencil, then these two rays are not as converging, right? They're, they're, um, they don't converge as quickly, they're, all, they're very parallel. Something that's very far away, something we said it's infinity, which for humans is a more than a, about like a few meters. Basically your depth perception runs out um, about five meters away or something like that. You really can't perceive depth. Those rays are almost parallel and, and that's just something that's, that's really far away. Okay, so now let's imagine that we're looking down through the surface of the water Where would, we, where would we see that fish compared to where the fish actually is? And for this, you might need to draw a couple of rays for yourself.
Yeah, so A is some B, some C's. So this one B, did I see a B? I thought it's not B. Bunch of blank screens. I'll give you the B that you want. Okay, I don't want the B. I don't want, I don't want anything. I want to know what you think. So, so here's a question. So what we're really asking is about the light coming from the fish. So if I'm looking at say, so here's my, my bad, uh, let me see, how do you draw a fish? Uh, uh, okay, fish. All right, so if I'm looking at one ray coming from the fish, like if I'm thinking about light, so light hits the fish from somewhere, that I don't care about. The light, there's, a, there's a light somewhere and the light's hitting the fish. So it's like the fish is glowing. There's light coming off the fish in all directions. One ray coming from the fish might be going straight up through the water, right? I know that if the light hits the surface of the water flat, that it'll just continue going straight through. So now here's the question. If I draw a ray going this way, when it hits the surface of the water, which way does it bend? Does it bend to the left or bend to the right? Relative to its to the trajectory it would have taken without the without the interface. To the right, which would be away from the normal because it's going into air. Well, let's 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 double check that thinking, right? So here's theta one. Here's theta two, right? So in this case, this number is small because that's air, and this number is big because that's the water. So if this number is smaller than N1, then theta two has to be bigger than theta one. So this ray is gonna bend to the right. Right? So if I'm going from a fast medium to a slow medium, I bend towards the normal. If I'm going from a slow medium to a fast medium, I bend away from the normal. Right? And so this looks the same no matter which way the ray is traveling. If the ray could be traveling this way, it would follow the same path as the ray going outwards. Everybody with me here? Right? So, if you, so if you're coming out, you bend away from the normal, and so this ray will bend to the right. So if I have this ray going this way, which way is this going to bend? Is it going to bend to the right or to the left? So it'll bend to the left. Right? Similarly, I'll have a ray coming up this way, and it'll bend that way. I'll have a ray coming this way, and it'll bend that way. OK, so now imagine that you are above the water and you see those rays. Where do you think the fish is? Do you think the fish is, what is it? Um, uh, you think it's closer to the surface? Yeah, because those rays all seem to be coming from a point Here, they, see, they look like they're coming from the point here, when really they're coming from this thing down here. But this is an effect. And it doesn't matter where I look at it. If I look at it from up here, if I look at it from the top, or I look at it from the side, it still looks like these rays are all coming from a common point. I, it looks like a totally normal fish. Um, so it, it looks like it's all coming from a point. It's not distorted. It's not anything like that. And, and, so no, and now it might look at a slightly different depth depending on how I'm looking at it. I don't know. I'd have to work that out. But no, it didn't because all of those rays all converge to the same place. So it looks like it's shallower than it is. Now we've all seen this effect, right? This is what picture I showed you. Now ignore the looking at it from the side and just think about looking at it from the top, just as you're looking through the surface of the water. So you're looking at it right here, right? This bit of the straw looks, so the straw looks like it's kinked towards us, right? Like it's kinked shallower. And that's because the deeper, so as, so it's right next to the surface. Well, it looks like it's, you know, 10% shallow, 10% shallower and, and at zero, you haven't moved at all. So it still connects up. But if I look at any part of the, of the, uh, of the straw, the light, the rays coming from that straw make the straw appear as though it's shallower than it should be. And so this bit of the straw is, is, is higher towards us than it should be. So it looks like the straw is being kinked up towards us. And this happens for every piece of the straw, it happens a little bit differently. And so, and so it still looks like it's a line, but it's a line that's been put up towards us. So this is no longer following 
this straight line in this direction, it's kinked. So it looks like it's coming back towards us. And this is, this is, a, this is the refract, this is how we see refraction. This is how it, it looks to us. Because of course we can't see the light rays. We can only see the effects of the light rays. Um, we don't see the right, light rays that hit our eye. We can't see the rays as they're traveling. Um, but if you tried it with the laser in your acrylic block, you could actually see the refraction. If you look at it from sideways, you could see this happening. But that's, that's sort of a weirdo circumstance. All right, so. Oops. Right, so you want to aim below where the fish seems to be. That's what we just talked about. Now, Yeah. Now, why is that, Nick? You were quick off the mark. Why? Why would you? Why would you go there? Um, since it's a laser, it's going to refract with the light, so it's going to refract at the same amount that the image of the fish is. So that means that the laser will, like, by shooting at where the fish looks like, the laser is going to bend the correct angle to hit the fish. Right. Right. Because you're following back, and what this problem illustrates is this thing that the light ray can travel in either direction. Right, is it doesn't matter which way the ray is traveling, the refractive law holds the same. So a light ray coming away from the fish is the same as a light ray that will be headed towards the fish. So those two things are uh, related to each other. Right. Let's just do one more here to make sure we're make sure we're on track. Which one of these is going to be refraction? If this is glass and this is air. or none of the above. Some C's and some B's. Stephen, why are you saying B? You're in the minority here. I think I misunder. I was trying to go for. I'm still trying to figure that out. Okay, I was going Aaron. All what do you angle, think? But I think I reasoned that wrong. Oh, I, I don't think so, Aaron. What do you think? C is the normal. C is so the it's normal. It's not going right. to go on the normal. Right. But it's going to that would be towards that would be the an normal. Angle Right, exactly. Is this because it was going this way? That'd be an angle of zero degrees, right? And that's not the case. You always have some angle there, so this would be on the right on the normal. A is not changing at all, so that can't be right. C is the normal, so that can't be right, and it can't be bending more than the normal. So the right answer here is B. It has to be somewhere between not changing at all and going straight at the normal. This little exercise here is an important one when we're going to move to some other conditions. Here's one you can try yourself if you still got all the if you've got all the stuff from the lab. I think I've got the stuff here someplace.
Interesting. Now, hold, keep holding your card up if you've already done the lab. So those of you who haven't done the lab, put your cards down. Okay, so, so, some, of you, so some of you have a different experience from other people. So let's just try it. That's the easiest thing. I've got my piece of acrylic here that, from the lab, right? You guys can do this at home if you feel like following along. So I've got two lines here. And we will look through them, through the camera, with this. Just bending it to the left, bending it to the right. You can see the lines stay the same distance apart, right? If I look at my handwriting here, nothing changes, nothing distorts in the handwriting. So they aren't moving, so it's not getting narrower or further away, but it's shifting. Now, if you think about what's going on here, right? So here's the glass and here's like one of the lines and here's the other one of the lines and we're looking at it from the top, right? So if I think about a ray, um, so if I put it like this, like the rays are just gonna go straight through and there's not gonna be any distortion. That's, so that looks the same, right? That's looking straight through a window. But now if I look at it with an angle, so here's my two lines and now here's my piece of glass. Think about a ray that's, let, let's take a ray that goes straight up here, right? Well, it's gonna bend towards the normal. So it'll bend slightly to the left here and go this way. But now it'll hit this normal and it'll bend slightly to the right. It'll bend so here. So in the first interface, it bends slightly towards the normal. And the second interface, it bends back exactly the same amount. So this angle and this angle have to be the same because N1 sine theta one equals N2 sine theta two equals N3 sine theta three. So this is N1, N2, N3, right? So this is true of the second interface. This is true of the first interface. So this has to be the same as this. So the angle on the outside has to be the same. So the, so the line, so this ray, no matter how it's coming in, is always gonna come out at the same direction as the coming in. So this, so this ray coming out will also be going straight up. But in the meantime, it got shifted to the left and that'll happen to the other ray as well. It'll get shift, it'll move slightly to the left before it comes out. And so the whole image shifts to the left if you raise up the light like that. So the whole thing shifts, which is kind of an interest, which is a function of the fact that the slab of plastic I'm using is flat. And we'll look at a non-flat piece of plastic later. Fun, fun. Now, there's a couple of, before we move on from refraction, there's a couple of interesting little tidbits about refraction that explain some things that you may or may not have noticed. What, here's one. Um, and that is, is that the, I said the refractive index of air is um, about the same thing as one. Well, that's a bit of a lie. And in fact, the refractive index of air, this scale is completely wrong. Um, this is, should be like, they have lots of extra zeros in here. But the, the refractive index of air, this, so this is, these numbers are just bogus. It changes slightly depending on what temperature the air is. So hot air and cold air have a slightly different refractive index. Not much, just a little bit. But what this means though, is if you ever have a ray of light that's going through hot air as opposed to cold air. So if it goes from a region of hot air to cold air, or a region of cold air to hot air, the light ray can bend a little bit. And so one effect of that is this, is heat shimmer, right? So if you're ever looking at the air over a fire or sometimes the air over a very hot road or over a very hot plate, you'll notice the air has that, has that weirdo kind of wavy effect. It, it looks like the back, the, the scene you're looking at gets, gets hazy and kind of warped. And so what you're looking at is you're looking at the light rays bending and then bending back as they go through these regions of hot air. And of course the hot air is moving around. So the bending's changing as you go along. And so, so that's where heat shimmer comes from is it comes to become the fact that the refractive index of air changes slightly as you change the temperature of the medium. One of the really cool things though is uh, what happens when you're driving along in a flat country on a long, flat road in the summertime. And what you see when you do that, and I'm sure everyone has, has had this uh, effect, is you're in a long, flat road and there's no cars in front of you. This happens a lot where I grew up in Alberta. 
And if you look at the road, like half a mile ahead of you, you see what looks like a patch of water, right? And as you drive closer, it disappears, but there's sort of another patch of water that still seems to be a half mile away in front of you. That's a mirage. That's what the technically a mirage is that happens in the desert as well. It looks like water. Well, this is also explained by this same effect. And what's going on is this. From far away, you're seeing light, like say from a mountain that's on the horizon. And so rays coming towards you, and this is very exaggerated, it doesn't look like this. Way. So the light ray is coming from far away, and it's, and it's aimed, and so this particular light ray is aimed and was, hit, was going to hit the road. But as it's coming in, the air near the road is hot because the pavement is black, and so it's heating up the air right near it, and the air above it is cooler. So what happens is you have this region of hot air right near the black asphalt, which is sucking up all this heat from the sun. And so this air is hot and this air is cold. So this has got a bigger refractive index than this does. So what happens is, is, is we're going in, we bend slightly towards that new, um, that new uh, slower medium. So the slower medium makes the angle change as we're coming in. And in fact, if that refractive index is so big, it'll keep changing. It can actually, because this is a gradual change, it can keep changing and in that fact, bend the ray all the way around so it's coming slightly upwards. So now this is you in your car and you're looking at the road half a mile ahead of you. And you can see, and you're looking slightly down at that, at that road half a mile ahead of you. And what you see is you see sky or you see that mountaintop, right? You're seeing sky and, the, and in our and in the monkey brains we have if you look at the ground and see sky there's water there right that's the only time you ever see you ever see sky on the ground is if there's water there. you see a bright patch of a bright blue or a bright white patch of light on the ground that's reflected light from water and so that's how we interpret it but really what we're seeing is we are seeing sky but we're not seeing a reflection we're seeing a refraction so that's how a mirage works. Very, very weird. And you only get these under very strange conditions, right? But this sort of thing does happen all the time. I just love this. I think this is like really, really cool. Aww. Here's one more thing. Here's one more effect that's very, very cool. Now, you guys may remember back when we started talking about waves, and I gave you a rule. And I said, the rule is, is that the speed depends, of a wave depends on the medium and nothing else. I said, no matter how you wiggle your string, the wave is always going to travel at the same speed down the string. And the only thing it depends upon is how tightly you're pulling the string and how heavy the string is. Now, that was mostly true. It was this tiny, tiny little bit of a lie because it's actually not 100% true. So that in fact, the speed of a wave can sometimes be a function of the frequency. Now, it's, it's very rarely a strong function of the frequency. Usually it's a very weak function of the frequency, but it does happen. So one of the things that can happen is that you can have a medium where the light travels at slightly different speed if the light, if the, if the frequency of the light is higher or lower. And that happens in, with light in glass and light in uh, air. If you have, looking at glass, and I take a piece of glass like this and I shine a light into it, well, the light's gonna refract, maybe it'll refract like this and then it'll refract again coming out, right? So I'll get two refractions. I get a refraction there and a refraction there, both of which if I angle, if I use this piece of glass like this, they'll both angle it to the right. However, and how much this ray gets bent from this way to this way depends on what the refractive index is of the glass. But if the refractive index is different for different colors, then that means different colors will get bent differently. And so red colors and blue colors will get bent different amounts. And so you get a rainbow over here. And that's how a prism works. And you can actually look through a light through like the corner of your, um, of your, uh, of your thing. And you can sometimes get a, get a sense of a, uh, this is making it a little bit of a, maybe not. I should have figured out how to do it ahead of time. Anyway, you can do that. 
One other effect that this has is another place this shows up is if you have a droplet of water. Let's take a droplet of water and I'll blow it up real big. And let's say I have light coming in this way. What's going to happen is the light's going to refract off the inside of the drop a little bit. And what happens is because the back of the drop is so, is so um, round, you're actually going to get total internal reflection here. And so then the light will bounce off the back of the drop and come out the other side. And if you have a glass sphere, you'll notice that you see reflections off the back of the glass. This and this are both refractions from air to water. But if water has got this thing going on called dispersion, So if you have dispersion going on in the water, what you get is this. So the sunlight comes in and, ref and reflects off the back and comes back out, but these refractions are functions of the color. So red light will refract less than blue light. So I have a water drop up here, light comes off and sunlight, which is made up of all different colors, the, the, the red light will bounce and come out this way and the blue light will bounce and come out this way. And here's another raindrop. The light's coming in from the same direction from far away. So the sunlight comes in here, it bounces off a drop, and here it does this, and the red light's coming out low, and the blue light's coming out high. Now I'm standing back here, and I am looking at a whole bunch of raindrops, because there's been a recent, there's this rain shower of like 10 miles away from me, and I'm going and looking at that, but it's a sunny day outside that cloud, and so there's sunlight, it's coming into that to, those, to that rainfall with all those water drops. And the light bounces off the water drops and comes back to me. But if I look up this way at the top of the rainbow, I'm going to see the light that's going to bounce off the back of those raindrops and hit my eye is red light. And if I look at the bottom of the rainbow, the light that comes back off and hitting me is violet light. So when I look, I see these colors reflected depending on what angle I'm looking at. And so that's how rainbows happen which is kind of cool. If anyone has questions about this, they should interrupt because this is, I'm just gonna keep talking. Now, let me show you one more cool, this is a cool thing I found a few years ago and I just, I can't not show it just because it's so cool. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna look at that. Okay, I was reading a blog, I don't care about the blog. So this is a recording um, that was made uh, by putting a microphone in a sheet and a, and, a, and a lake of ice so that the lake has frozen over. And you can hear this without putting the microphone in it. I've heard this on a mountain lake myself. So this is a spring day and the ice is cracking. And so when the ice cracks, it makes a noise, which is a wave, which travels through the ice. But it turns out ice has got a lot of dispersion. So high notes and low notes, which are different frequencies, travel faster or slower. And so when you hear that the crack happens far away, the sound from it, from the different, the different parts of that crack, so a crack is like a white noise with lots of different frequencies. And that crack then, the high pitches and the low pitches travel and get to you at different times. This is a completely natural sound. another bit. Right. This is the sound that, of course, special effects people like to use as lasers, right? <laughs> lasers do not make a sound. Um, and it's just, it's just really weird. It sounds like a synthesizer because what it's doing is you're hearing, you're hearing a frequency ramp, right? Boom. You're also hearing reflections because, because as the waves hit the side of the pond, they reflect back at us. And so you hear, wow, right? you hear it happening multiple times because you're hearing the sound bounce back and forth across the lake. This is just so amazingly cool. I can't not share that. So let me see how we're doing here for time. All right, let's move on. I'm gonna skip principle of least action, although it's really cool. So now I wanna talk about images. So an image is where um, 
you have light changing so you can see, uh, see a thing that isn't there, right? So an object is like this pen, right? Is I have a pen and I'm going to this your screen, advance and camera. So I have this, and so what's happening is light is coming from the light in the room. It's hitting, it's hitting the pen. It's bouncing off the pen and hitting our eye. And we see, this is just like the fish, right? We see, we see rays coming from it. And so we see where it is. And so this is called an object. The object has got rays coming off of it. But if somehow I could manage to make it look like there was a fish here, and I could make it look like there was a fish here if I had rays coming from this point in space that looked like fish rays, right? That had the kind of same color as fish and same configuration. An object here would make rays coming out like this. But one way I could do that is by having rays coming from somewhere that looked like as though there was a fish there. So we've already seen one example of an image, which is if you're looking in water, it looks like there's a fish somewhere when the fish isn't really there. The fish is actually sitting beneath it. What you're seeing is you're seeing an image of the fish. You're seeing light rays that look like they're coming from an object, but aren't. They're coming from a thing that isn't there. And that thing that isn't there is an image. And you guys pretty much understand this. You, you said more or less this in the warm-ups, so I didn't feel like I had to uh, uh, go through it in much detail. And so this is one way of making an image. I want to show you another way of making an image. I don't remember the tech, this textbook talks about it, but I love this. And it's a thing called the camera obscura. The camera obscura is actually really neat. If, if, and so if you're bored um, after classes end, you want something to do, find a room in your house with only a few windows and completely black them out. And a good thing for doing that is actually tinfoil. So you take some tinfoil and tape it all around the window. And then what you do is in, on a sun, nice sunny day, you poke a tiny hole in that thing. So I'm gonna have, so this is gonna be outside and this is inside the room. And here's a tiny little pinhole that you can poke in the wall. And then what you do is you look at the far side of the room. Now, if the room has to be very dark because in order to, because there's not gonna be very much light coming through this pinhole. But any light that comes through the pinhole has to come through it in a certain way because the hole is very small. So for instance, let's say I had like a tree out here, right? Like that's a very badly drawn tree. Um, and I have light coming from that tree. So let me just pick up the pen here. So I have light coming. So let's say I have light coming from like the top of this tree. Well, light's coming off this top of the tree in lots of different directions. Only the ray that goes through that pinhole will make it to the far side. None of these other rays will make it through. If I look at the bottom of the tree, let's say I pick a point right here on the tree, the only ray that makes it through that pinhole goes through that point. The only ray that makes it through the hole this, from this part of the tree is this point. So what you see on the far side is projected on the wall will be an inverse image of that, will be an upside down image of that tree. So it's a way you can get a projection on the wall because this pinhole restricts which rays make it to the far wall. So you get a picture of the thing on the far wall. This is very cool. They used to do this, this was like high entertainment in the 18th century. You'd go and you'd somebody have a camera obscura and oh, you could spy on the people outside the house without them seeing you. Oh, so yeah. Um, now, this is interesting because this is also an image. It looks like there's a thing there that isn't. Now, this is the exa an example of a real image. That is to say, light is being focused. All the light from this thing is being focused onto a screen over here, and then it bounces off the screen to hit our eyes. The one we were looking at before, we were looking at the fish underwater. There, we're looking at the image directly with our eyeballs. We can see the image, and this is called a virtual image. A real image is one where you put it on a screen. The image exists on a screen. The light rays are being focused onto a screen that you're then looking at. A virtual image is where you're looking into your optical instrument and rays are hitting your eye. And so it appears there appears to be a thing there. So those are the two kinds of images. Um, here, let me show you an example of one. This was an artist, um, I think it's, I forget this is an Italian artist. Um, I found this like 10 years ago and I just love it. This is a boardroom um, from uh, in an office tower in Chicago. I 
I think it was Chicago. And uh, so he's built, so, so there was a window on one side of the room, which he blocked off and he built a pinhole and he took a picture of the scene from inside the room, a long exposure picture. So you can see here's the, here's this, the meeting desk where everyone would line up and a telephone on it and the, and the chairs. Zoom in on that a little bit. And then you can see off into the distance, you can see the, let me, see, let me uh, reduce the exposure there a little bit so we can see it more clearly. So you can see the cityscape projected on the far wall upside down. And he's making a statement here about you know, like the captains of industry and the, you know, the realm they survey when they look out. I, I just, I like, the, I like the two images juxtaposed. But you can do this. Uh, it's, it's kind of fun to do this sometimes. You have to have a really dark room and just a tiny little pinhole. So let me ask you guys, what would happen if you didn't make a tiny pinhole, if you made like a big hole? How would your image change? So I made you would let too much, hmm? you would let too much light in um, for it to actually create a image like that, um, which is essentially what we have with Windows is because it just lets all of the spectrums of light through. It's the, yeah, it's not the spectrum; it's the directions of light. So what's so what directions of light? Did, that's what I meant. Right. So what happened if we made just a big pinhole? So the pinhole wasn't teeny tiny; we just enlarged it a little bit. So not so big that's a giant hole, but it's just a little bit. What would happen? Um, wouldn't the image get like a little bit blurred? Like yeah. it wouldn't be like, you would still be able to tell the colors a little bit, but it wouldn't create as clean of an image than with a tiny hole. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. So if I looked, for instance, at this place on the screen, it would no longer be getting light just from this part of the tree. It would also be getting a light from this part of the tree up here because now my hole is bigger. So it's letting in more rays from more directions. So now what happens is the, rim, the image gets blurrier and that'll happen very quickly. If you get to like a centimeter wide pinhole, then the image starts getting blurry. But also the image will be getting brighter because you're letting more light in. This is exactly the same trade-off that you have when working with lenses. If you want a very sharp image, you need not much light. If you want to have a very, a very bright image, you need lots of light. But you, if you open up the hole much bigger, it gets blurrier. And this is a, this is a fundamental trade-off that you have even when working with cameras. There's ways you can play the game to improve that with cameras, but this is a fundamental trade-off that you get when working with any optical system. So, um, so that's one kind of image. Right, another kind of image is one that we deal with all the time, and that is a mirror, right? If I have my pencil right here, and I look at it, and I look at it in the mirror, so this is uh, me looking at it, so I'll look at it over here, right? What I'm gonna see is there'll be a ray that comes from the tip of the pencil, bounces off the mirror by angle of incidence equals angle of reflection, and hits my eye. And there'll be another ray coming from the back of the pencil that comes up and hit my, hits my eye. And these rays look to me identically to a pencil that's actually sitting behind the mirror, um, inverted, right? It's left, right, inverted for for um, geometric reasons, but it looks like it, it looks like there's a thing on the other side of the mirror that looks just like my original object because it's I'm seeing the light rays from the other side of the object bounce off the off the mirror and back to my eye. So this is a virtual image, just like the fish is a virtual image. I have to look into the mirror to see it. But this is another perfectly valid idea of an image. And in fact, these guys sound like they're very easy. One question I love asking people is why does a mirror flip, flip things left and right, but not up and down? I won't go into that right away. Let's just start with this.
Great. This isn't a trick question or anything. This is just really straightforward. So yeah, the answer here is D. Because people are being lazy, right? It's going to be this. So it's going to look, this thing will look like it's over here. All right. So now let's imagine you're looking at yourself. And so here's the problem. I want to have a mirror in my room where I can see my shoes and I can see my hair at the same time. What kind of mirror or how will I have to look at a mirror in order to see both my shoes and my hair in my reflection? Some A's. It's it's certainly true that this would work if I had the mirror that big. That you know, because we've all seen mirrors like that. But that's not necessarily the answer. On how far away you were from it. That's a good question, and we'll I'm, I'm, let me come back to that one, Stephen. Because I think that's a, that's a really really uh, uh, interesting uh, question that we want to deal with. All right, so we have a range of answers all the way from A to E. All right. Normally, I'd have you guys talk this out, but we can't easily do that in here, and we don't have a lot of time. Um, it's a fun idea to think about. Let me show you one way you can think about it. Here's you wearing casual clothes in a briefcase for some reason, and here is your, uh, here's your image, right? Your, your, your twin is standing on the other side of this mirror, right? So this is the image, which doesn't really exist, but we can think about you having an identical twin that's standing the same distance from the mirror as you are. Okay, so now I want to see my twin's shoes, right? So the line between my eye and their shoe is along here. I want to see their head and the, and the line from their eye to the head is along this line. And this should be a straight line, although it looks kind of kinked because of the way we're drawing it. Now imagine instead if I have a mirror here, I had a wall and I'm going to cut a hole in the wall so I can see my twin, right? Well, I could have wall here and that wouldn't interfere with my view of their feet. And I could have a wall a little bit up here and that wouldn't interfere with my, fear, with my view of the top of their head. So if I had a wall that was um, between the midpoint between my eye and the top of their head, that would also be okay. So I could block those in with wall and I could still see my twin's head and my twin's feet. No problem. If I think about it, where this point is, is halfway between my eye and their feet. Halfway up is where that thing could be. And also halfway between here and here, right? If you ignore this part and you just think about your eyes being on the top of your body, which is you know, kind of approximately true, although we'd look pretty funny if that were true, right? This is halfway up. So you need a mirror that's half your height in order to see it. Now, let's go back to, uh, let's go back to that question, which way does it matter how far away you are for that to work? Confident no, confident yes. Well, you look at the geometry carefully and you think about, so if you take a step back, your twin also takes a step back. So that line which connects them looks to look like this and now looks like this. But that midpoint is still in the same place. And if you don't believe me, I'll, I like doing this experiment in class as well. So I've got a small mirror I borrowed from my wife. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna point it at the camera. Let me, let me turn off, or let me, I'll use this guy. Hi, hi for me upside down. All right, so now look at the camera in the reflection. Right, so I'm holding up the mirror and you can see the camera in the mirror and you can see parts of the camera, right? You can see not all of the camera, but you can see part of it. Now, as I bring the mirror back, whoop, and I have to aim it at the camera again. Uh, okay, now, if you're looking at it, you're, you can see, ah, 
kind of keep losing it, you can see about the same amount of camera as you could as you could before. I still can't see the base of the camera. I can only see that head of the camera. If I pull it back even further, now that now the mirror is very small. Now lining this up is going to be a pain. Oh, I had it. Uh, again, you can see about the same amount of the mirror. Because as I bring the cam as I bring the mirror back, I have less view, but the thing I'm looking at has gotten further away too. So those angles are always going to balance, and it doesn't matter how far away you are. This logic doesn't depend on this distance. If I double this distance, I'm also if I double this distance, I'm also doubling this distance, and so that line still bisects the halfway point between your eye and your feet. So the logic still works either way. And you can test this out. The only reason this doesn't work well in a bathroom mirror is because you have the counter sticking out. And the counter actually blocks the view of your feet. But other than that, that's all you need is you need a half height mirror to, uh, to get by with this. This is a great, I love this problem because it has nothing to do with physics. It's just like looking at angles. Okay, so let me just take a couple of minutes here. Okay, let's stop looking at me upside down. That's getting distracting. Um, Stop share, share screen. I want to talk just briefly about lenses now. Here. So what I've got here is, so this is another FET demo. And what I've got here is I've got a lens, um, which is a shaped piece of plastic. And what, and so let me just zoom in here on something happening. So let's just do this. All right. So one thing you can see is going on is I've got rays coming from this tip of my pencil, right? So imagine the tip of my pencil were glowing, which it kind of is. And all the white lines are rays that are headed straight away from the pencil. Now, when a ray enters this piece of glass, now this is a shaped piece of glass, right? It's like two hemispheres of glass smushed together. When it enters that glass, it bends towards the normal, it bends towards the normal of the glass. And then on leaving the glass, it bends again away from the normal, but the two normals are pointing in different directions in the glass. One normal is like this, and one normal is like this. And so it bends twice, and it bends twice in the same direction. So a light ray coming this way will bend flatter, and a light ray bending coming out here will bend flatter again. In fact, if I bring this to the right place, there, it will bend the rays so that they're all exactly flat. Or if I had a beam of light coming from the right, like if the sun were far away on the right, or, uh, or something like that, then those rays from the sun would be coming, all, would be coming almost parallel because the sun's very far away. So I'd have all these rays coming in and they'd all get focused down on a spot. And so this is, you know, little boys burning ants, right? You can get out a magnifying glass and you can and you can fry ants by putting all the light from the sun on one tiny little spot. So you can start a fire, you can burn some paper. So that's what a lens does. A lens, a lens of this type focuses. You can also have a, um, let me see, do I, can I get an inverse lens? Can I have a, a diverging lens? No, not on this. All right, I can make the lens bigger or smaller, but it will, depending on this, but it, what depends on how much it focuses depends on the shape, not on how big it is. Now, if I think about what's ha gonna happen here. So now I'm going to have my object here on the left, and it's not at the focal point, but I can see these white rays coming off the tip of my pencil. They're gonna hit this lens, and each ray that hits the lens is gonna get bent differently. And if I look at where they wind up, there's a place over here on the right where all of those rays will hit the same spot. Now again, if I put a screen right at this place right here on the right, then all of the rays from the tip of the pencil that hit the lens will be focused on the thing on the right, which is the same thing as the pinhole, except the pinhole only accepted this one ray in the middle because the pinhole was very tiny. It said all the rays from the tip of the pencil will hit one specific spot on the wall. Well, in this case, all the rays that hit the lens hit this specific spot on the wall. So this is how you build a projector, right? The thing on the left is some little tiny LCD screen that we have inside our, we have inside our thing. And let me turn up the, um, turn up the, uh, the, the magnification here of the lens. So there I have a tiny little thing inside my overhead projector. It's making, it's got a little tiny screen, like a little phone screen that's really brightly lit. 
that's giving off the light. And then I've got a lens, which is what you can see on the outside of the overhead projector, is bending that light and focusing it on the screen some distance away. If the screen is in the wrong place, then the image will be fuzzy. If I put the screen, say, here, then the rays aren't exactly converging, and so I'll have a messy image. So what a lens does is it does the same thing as the camera obscura. It does the same thing as the pinhole, but it accepts more rays of light. And the bigger my, my lens is, the more light rays I can capture. And so this allows us to get through the basic idea. And this is how lots of instruments work. This is also a camera. In a camera, my object is, is over here. It's creating this ray of light. And inside this box, I've got some film or I've got a photosensitive device like a CCD that can detect when light is hitting it. When I open the shutter, the light comes through the camera lens, hits the back of it, and then I can all the light that hits here is from, from the one end of the pencil, and the light that hits here is from the other. Wrap this in squishy stuff and instead of a, and have this lens be made out of organic material, and this is an eyeball. On the left is an object outside the world. On the right, in here, there's a photosensitive surface of your, of your retina, and the light is being focused from the outside world onto the retina. Except there's a, there's a few more complications to that, a lot of different complications. But that's the basic idea of how every optical system works. And it all works through the basic principle of refraction. Now, there's a lot of detail we can go into this, like how do you build a microscope and how do you build a telescope, how do glasses work, magnifying glasses versus other kinds. But the, all I, the ideas work the same is they build images. One thing you can do is um, you can have a virtual image like this. So in this case, these rays never can be focused on a screen. But if I were looking at it, if I were standing on the right-hand side over here and looking at it, what I would see is I would see a pencil way back here because those rays look like they're coming from a distant object. That's how my glasses work. I have a hard time, because I'm old, I have a hard time focusing on things really close to my eye. So what my bifocal lens part does is it takes things that are really close and forms images of them further away. That's how glasses work. That's how nearsighted uh, far-sighted glasses work. If you're nearsighted, you can't see things far away and you have to bring them closer. And so you actually have a diverging lens. And what that does is it takes an object that's far away and makes an image of it closer where your eye can focus on it and you can see it. Um, so that's, uh, so in fact, if you're far-sighted, your lenses don't do this. They, they diverge. And I don't think I can put a diverging lens in this simulation. Uh, no, there's no way of doing it. Oh, I can show the virtual image. There's the virtual image. I can also put a screen in. Oh, that's cool. So that's what you get if you've got a if you're at the right place, and this is if you have a fuzzy image. Oh, I forgot I could do that. Anyway, so this is the stuff we don't have time to get into. And the, the rules for how you build lenses are not very complicated. And this is generally seen as a fun thing. It's also a useful thing if you're into microscopy or astronomy or other things. And so I don't have really a time to go into this and teach this to you properly. So this is to be the end of the course usually is we'd stop with this stuff, which is kind of fun and kind of interesting. So, but I don't, we don't really have time to get into it. So I'm going to stop it there. Okay, so I just want so I just wanted to go over kind of what an optical instrument does. It forms images, and it forms images through this sequence of refraction. All right, I'm going to call code on the course here. Sorry, I went a couple. Did I? No, I'm not quite over yet. I'm um, um, uh, we're going to say this is going to be the content for the course is up to and including Snell's law and refraction, maybe with a one or two side questions on the things we've touched on today about image formation and that sort of thing. But that's going to be um, the content of the course. You have everything you need to do, the homework, which ideally I'd like handed in uh, on Friday so we can talk about it in class if you guys want, if you guys have problems with it. But if it comes in late, that's okay too. I'm not going to worry about this. Uh, we've got our exam week from Friday. I'm going to be available. So next class, we'll, I'll either answer questions or I'll talk a little bit about quantum mechanics depending on how people want to do it. And you can put your suggestions in the warm up for what you want to do next class. And um, uh, that's it. Questions, comments, thoughts, worries, panics? Final exam is cumulative, right? Yes. Um, but I will tend to focus on the stuff since the last midterm. So the stuff in the last midterm will all definitely be on it. 
there'll be at least, there'll be questions on everything that we have done since the last midterm, um, but which includes, uh, it includes induction, right? Faraday's, so Lenz's law and Faraday's law, as well as all the stuff we've done on light. Um, so polarization, interference and that. So that stuff will definitely be heavily represented on the exam, but everything else will be on as well. So yeah, it, 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 and it'll be sort of like one third of the exam will be stuff since one, between one third and one half of the exam will be stuff since the last midterm. Um, and then everything else is also fair game um, from waves all the way through. But at this point, you can kind of see why this course was put together the way it was, is talking about waves and optics and ENM Electrostatic magnetism are all part of the same story of physics, basically, and uh, it all comes together, I think, rather nicely. I love this course a lot more than 1500. 1500 is boring with all the blocks and slopes. Friction. And for the final, are we going to be on Zoom, or are we just doing it and then sending it to you? Uh, let's uh, let's let's do it on Zoom, just because that way, if you guys have questions or if I make a mistake on the exam, um, you can ask me a quick question. Um, but it'll be, uh, it'll be the same rules as the midterm. That, that way we're just kind of, we're kind of doing it together. That way we know we're doing it all at the same time. And if there's any issues, we're just ready to deal with it. Um, I, I, you, no, you don't necessarily need to even keep your cameras on, I think. I trust you guys enough. But the same rules as before, you're allowed to use your notes, you're allowed to use your um, uh, old assignments and stuff. You can look at anything you've got on hand for the course, but I'd ask you not to look up anything online. Because sometimes you can Google a question and that's not fair. Otherwise, I have to, you know, rigorously remove all questions that are Googleable, and that means I'll be left with only the hard questions, and I don't want to do that. So, so everyone can be on the honor system to, to not use the internet. Good. I'll I'll can talk more about the final exam on Friday. Okay. Have a good one. Hang in there, have a, last, have a good last week of pseudo university this year. I'll see you later. <laughs>